Hi, Misha here. And in my last video, the black box, I was pretty negative about Eagle Moss. Not so much for their models themselves, but for a recent snafu that anyone can do. No problem there, but a week on, they've yet to even start to rectify. But I don't like being a negative person, in, at least not you know, all the time. So let's talk about something truly new, neat, and that people have been asking for for literally 20 years, or nearly so. How about a die-cast model from Stargate? Eagle Moss announced in September of 2021 that they had the license to produce models from not only SG-1 or Atlantis or Universe, but all of those. Plus, it seems like they also have the license from the movie, although I don't know how much good that'll be. It might be. And the first model, issue one, is the USS Daedalus, also known as the Daedalus class, or BC-304. A warship, battleship, or as I like to think of it in the coolest term, deep space carrier. This sounds neater. This was supposed to be out November 30th. Instead, they decided to release it February 2022. And best I could tell, the delay, they had the assets, the computer generated the CGI models, but since some of them were from the late 90s, some early 2000s, yeah, they they could do with a little updating, modernizing, and being conveyed over into modern formatting. It probably just took more time than they anticipated, plus, let's be honest, 2020, 2021, and now even 2022, overseas production has been interesting but it's here finally so uh, let's look at the model and talk about it on to the spinny thingy we go pretty typical eagle moss model mostly well the center section is uh, metal with the details and the outer sections and of course the antennae being uh, a pretty good polymer pretty durable It'll bend before it breaks, which is about all you can ask. Pretty standard center cradle stand. It doesn't clip on, it just rests on it, which is, I think, what most people prefer. And it has the standard relatively weighted base with the number and everything. We'll take a closer look. But, yeah, people have been wanting someone to do Stargate models for a long time. Now, of course, Stargate... Well, it started off as Stargate, so the gate, and thus people moving on foot. And that's kind of how the first several seasons were, although the Gould, or Gould, if you're Hammond, uh, well, did have ships from the very beginning, even the movie. And later, of course, the Asgard would have ships, and so on and so forth. Well, around 2000. Two, the humans decided, hey, we want to ship two. Their first effort, though, the X-301, it didn't go so hot. <laughs> there was a fighter. The next effort, the X-302, which was totally Earth-built, although using reverse engineering technology, went a lot better, and as in it didn't try to kill its crew. Those are both two-seat fighter interceptors. The X-303 would appear in 2003, also known as the Prometheus and later classed as the BC-303. It was primarily a human-built ship powered by uh, human technology, for the most part fusion reactors and uh, Naquita and what have you, using reverse-engineered and scavenged gold technology. Later it would get some Asgard technology implemented like a primitive beaming system. And that would evolve into the BC-304. They were going to mass-produce the 303, but 
technology advanced over the years as it's want to do. So by the time the next generation was ready to go, the Daedalus here in 2005, the space frame had changed, incorporating more gold and more importantly, more Asgard technology from the outset. For example, the beaming system was integral to the design itself, as were Asgard shields. However, in the beginning, the Asgards really weren't keen on giving weapons. So, when the Daedalus launched and was sent to the Pegasus galaxy, it had 32 railgun turrets and 16 vertically launched missile tubes. You know, they could fire either conventional cruise missiles or nuclear missiles, be they Mark III, Mark seven, Mark eight, or even Mark nine missiles. That would be the Daedalus. It would be the first one in the series. This one's marked O2 because the Prometheus was O1. And uh, it was a little larger. Now, some places want to say this was 650 meters long. That's ridiculous. That would be the Starship Enterprise D. That's not... That's not how size works. Most places give it a length of about 225 meters, which is still quite big. That's about the size of the Enterprise NX-01 and not much smaller than the Enterprise 1701. So, plenty big. It's also quite wide at about 95 meters. And it's pretty thick, too, all things considered. Keep in mind, not only does this operate in space, it's expected to land and operate in an atmosphere. If it were 650 meters long, more than half a kilometer, that could present problems. Moreover, it only has a crew of 200. And it can only support, via the life support systems, about 250 people. So, that's its max. If it were 650 meters Let's put it like this. The Enterprise D, with only a thousand crew, is considered to be sparsely populated. At the same length, being wider and quite thick, with only 200, maybe 250 people max on board, it would be downright lonely. Plus, it's said that it can be operated, at least at minimal level, with a minimal crew of just four people. And when we look at the bridge, there's only seating for three. Uh, commander, captain in the center, navigator, helm on his left, and weapons, tactical officer on the right. There are other computer consoles and standing stations, but those seem to be people just coming on and off the bridge. Even the engineering room isn't huge. You know, housing eight people, maybe a maximum of 12. So, yeah, just looking at the systems. Now, there are a lot of things on board. And, uh, you know, a lot of points because this was a good shooting location for the series. Just like how um, Babylon 5 ended up getting the White Star and Deep Space Nine got the Defiant. In 2003-2005, the Stargate SG-1 and then Atlantis decided, hey, we want a ship too. A year after the Daedalus was launched, the next ship was the USS Odyssey 2006, and it was quickly followed up by a presumably American-built ship that was transferred to the Russians, becoming the RFS Korolev. Of course, that was named after their very famous scientist and space pioneer, and it was commanded by Chekhov. <laughs> the uh, Daedalus here was commanded by uh, Caldwell, which I actually really liked him. And those would be the main ships. So, of course, the Korolev would not last long, being blowed up pretty much on its maiden voyage. The next American version would be the USS Apollo. And then that would have been followed by the USS Phoenix. But because of the death of the real-world actor, the next American version, the USS, Air, the Air Force version, was the General George Hammond. Nice tribute. It was launched around the same time as the uh, one version operated by the Chinese, the Sun Tzu. 
Art of War fame, meaning that a total of six have been built by 2009-2010, and Apocrypha has more built. And these were pretty much the crown jewel in the SGC budget, costing billions of dollars each to produce, and increasingly equipped with more and more Asgard technology. For example, in 2007, they were retrofitted with four Asgard beam weapon batteries. These were superheated force plasma beams that were very finely focused, very precisely targeted, and they had variable yield, so you could kind of decide how much destruction he wanted to do. Like I said earlier, it had Asgard shielding. It also had Asgard beaming, as well as the Ancients' ring transport systems. And later, ships like the Hammond would have uh, larger flight bays and uh, more advanced railgun systems, extra thrust, and all that good stuff. You know. So they would continue to improve the design, but generally speaking, the BC-304 space frame would more or less remain unchanged. So with that, let's talk about some features. And for that, let's take her off the stand. Like I said, this just cradles in. Perfectly fine. And like I said, it does have the name and number under the thing and uh, looking at the model yeah the central section here is all metal leading back and you get to of course the engines these are plastic they say ABS polymer this is all plastic to give more detail so most of the weights kind of towards the front and the neck so we've talked about the weapon systems Asgard beams, missile tubes, rail guns. Some versions also had a bomb bay on the uh, underside. And on the other side, we had one of the engine systems. There were four vertical thrust engines to let it hover or vertically take off and land. So like a really advanced and really big carrier. We also had thrusters in the back here relatively small engines these are more for you know maneuvering making small course corrections what have you maybe operating in atmosphere these are the two big sublight engines and they could propel the ship up to half the speed of light although more commonly it would operate at about a quarter of the speed and of course, the star of the show would be the hyperdrive system, which was an Asgard core. And this could be powered by uh, Naquita generators. It could also be powered by a ZPM or ZPM. <laughs> and it could also be powered by an Asgard power core. All these antennae. These are Asgard sensors and uh, comms array back here. This area is one of the two command bridges. This is kind of the larger one. I think it is like a CIC. The more of the battle bridge, if you will, is located more here on the neck. So we have two command systems, which is good. Uh, most vessels do have uh, two commands, not just for backup, but you know, different weathers. You know, naval vessels have done that for centuries. Of course, another major thing are the uh, bays. These hold the F-302. Each bay can hold up to eight. Another reason I don't think the size is too huge, because if it were... 650 meters, they could hold more than a total of 16. And a lot of the times, you'll see them only carrying eight, leaving one bay open for either cargo or docking of other ships. Uh, they could dock puddle jumpers. Um, An Alkesh can dock in there. That's about the biggest vessel that'll, that'll fit in these bays. They have physical doors with a force field when they're open. 
kind of standard Star Trek there. But they're just multi-purpose bays that also serve as flight bays. I also kind of like that they have small, not runways, but lips there. <laughs> it's kind of neat. That's the main part. That's the whole deep space carrier. But again, they also serve as a good place. You could put refugees, cargo, what have you. This is definitely a warship, though. This is no Federation ship designed for peace and exploration. It has good sensors and all that, but it's, it's combat-oriented. And its uh, internal structure is kind of you know, designed for that. We have standard things like a, a stateroom, a conference room. We have a gym, which is actually very important on a spacecraft. Now, while this does have artificial gravity, you know, uh, exercise facilities are a must in space. Uh, treadmills, bikes. I'm not so sure about having free weights on board. That might be a little risky in case anti-grav or the grav system fails, I should say, but that'd be great to have heavy weights floating around in weightless environment. <laughs> oh, well. It does have crew quarters. They're for this type of vessel actually pretty decent. They seem to be individual. But then again, when you only have a crew of 200, you probably have a little more latitude. There are also some observation lounges with a couch and computer terminals, kind of work and leisure areas. A general speaking mess hall. Keep in mind, they're if they're lucky, they're eating you know, fresh, uh, flash frozen food or canned food. If they're unlucky, they're eating MREs. No replicators on this thing. But it is designed for relatively long-term voyages, at least several weeks, because this is not interstellar, it's intergalactic, and it takes them two and a half weeks to get from one galaxy to another under standard power. So round trip, you're looking at a month, a little more than a month, and that's just a standard mission. So they were outfitted for at least a couple of months' supply in space. And like I said earlier, the life support systems really were designed for 200 people, they could stretch that a bit, but um, yeah, they do address things like carbon monoxide and all that good stuff, CO2, which are issues on real world spacecraft. And that's kind of maybe what sets this apart a little bit from Battlestar Galactica, which it does remind me of with the bays on the sides, or even things like Alien, which this does remind me a bit of uh, some of the ships from Alien with the head and antennae, or even Star Trek, all that stuff. This is a less advanced ship, tied a little bit more to the real world, although since it's using super advanced alien tech, they could kind of pull that out when needed, like the Asgard beaming systems and beam systems, as well as shields, and of course the uh, hyperdrive core. But it's, it seems to be a well-constructed model. It's got a decent amount of weight. It's a decent size. It's just about nine inches long. And it's yeah, a little under five inches wide. So not the biggest thing ever, but not teeny tiny for sure. And again, it's their first issue. So, you know, at least it finally came, even if it was uh, two months late. And now back on the stand. While I wouldn't say this is one of the most iconic starships in science fiction, it served its purpose and um, certainly was part of a long-lived franchise and had its own characteristics and um, whatnot. It, ser it served for what it was. And it's just one of those series that's been oft neglected for something that um, had... Uh, 17 seasons total on TV, plus one feature film and two direct-to-DVD movies. It's been pretty underrepresented. It really has. So it's nice that someone has the license. Now the question. Eagle Moss has had some issues. Not the least of which mine, mixing up an order, but more on the production end moving factories, changing times. Will they be able to give an expansive collection? I don't know. I hope so. 
because there's a lot of interesting ships here. Of course, we've got the Prometheus. They could do other versions, maybe as like special editions like they do with some of the Star Trek ships. There are, of course, the gold ships, which issue two should be out soon, and it's the Hatak. Plenty of ships there. There are the Asgard ships. There are a few ancient ships, including the Puddle Jumper and their Aurora. And there are plenty of other lesser known, but still quite interesting alien ships and even human ships. Of course, we've got fighters like the 301, the 302, the uh, Death Glider, the Needle Threader from the Gold. Yeah, there's a lot of potential here. So it'll be interesting to see how far they take it. Looks like they're ending the Stargate collection, excuse me, the uh, Battlestar Galactica collection at issue 25. They ended the Star Trek Discovery collection at issue 33, although they're carrying some over for the universe. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how far they take these. They're supposed to release one every quarter, so roughly speaking for a year if they can meet their target goals. So, yeah, we'll have to just see. I think this was a good choice to start with because even though it wasn't the first human ship on screen, it was kind of the most evolved human ship and most popular because of all the variants with the uh, Russian and Chinese operated ones and several sister ships amongst the humans. Makes sense. And of course, the, the hot tax a logical progression. you got to have the gold. But I think the Asgard ships will be quite popular. Just what I think. And of course, they have to do their Aurora sooner than later. Because I know there's quite a few fans of, uh, of that one. So let me know what you think. Um, <laughs> entertaining series. I mean, it's got MacGyver. So what can you do? It knows when to take itself reasonably serious, and it knows when to have fun. And uh, even though the first couple of seasons have some eh, once it gets into its groove, it's a pretty entertaining series, SG-1, that is. Atlantis pretty much hits the ground running. The first season is maybe a little too close to SG-1, but already by season two, they really find their own identity. And... Um, seems to take off. I think that's one. SG-1, 10 seasons was more than enough, but it would have been nice to see Atlantis get at least one more, I think, personally. Well, I appreciate you hanging out, tuning in for another science fiction thing, trying to do something different, hoping that we'll see some of the final BSG ships soon. And yeah, I actually had to flag the video for firearms content to have these in the background. But I just had to. Why not? <laughs> so yeah, post below what you think. If you like it, you hate it. If you think this is the good place to start. If you wish it were bigger, smaller. Whatever. But just trying to show something new for this weekend. Hope everyone's doing well. This is Misha. And I'll catch you very soon next time.